in this topic about design of shafts and beams, uh, you're seeing you have seen some some of these already, kind of. Or you've seen already what is the the main how to call it, kind of the foundation to do that. So this is pretty important in the sense that academically when we're talking you know when we're studying this so this is pretty obvious that okay well you know you are given an exercise usually it's an exercise presented as uh, in this figure here you have let's say one you know one line and then you have some elements mounted on the on the shaft and then they say okay now calculate the diameter of the shaft and then you know maybe calculate the deflection deflection of the shaft so that's pretty interesting you know for all level i also mentioned in this slide, and you know what? I was curious about this. I mentioned in this slide that you will see, or you know, kind of study this later uh, in a course named, you know, design of machine elements. And you could see in the idea of this slide that when you are given this, how it is possible that we can go from this uh, type of schematics to something like this? You know? So the this is a shaft here. Let me try to draw slash show something like no draw so here this one here this is a the drawn the drawing of a shaft you know it has a lot of let me let me make a zoom it here it has um a lot of you no know, dimensions tolerances uh you no know, these kind of uh different uh, diameters in depending on the section where are located those components uh, they have this kind of stuff so how do we go from from this to this here so you know believe me calculating the stresses and you know and this kind of stuff deflection is nothing compared to translating this idea this idea into this one here, something that you can actually send for, you know, for manufacturing, for manufacturing or or to manufacture it. So how to do it? And I wanted to talk, talk about this because I did review your or most of the curriculum about you know what was given or taught in this machine elements course, which is delivered by a friend of mine actually. I didn't know that he was he was delivering that course, and you are not going to see this. So Fortunately, you are not going to see how to go from from this in, on on the left to this on the light on the right. Uh, so some other topics that are which are important are approached in that course, but not specifically this. You know. So I wanted to talk to you about it because uh, so you could have a let's say a practical idea on how things are going to you know go down with this. So let's start with this. You have a schematic like this. It's okay. You have to design, you know, the diameter of the shaft. And usually, what when you get these type of examples or exercises in the university, uh, it, it's exactly like says like this. You know, determine the diameter of a solid shaft for the following case. So I took this from internet, from the internet, and you see here that uh something doesn't add up here doesn't kind of make sense that the whole sh just one shaft is you know or, or the shaft is just you know built or manufactured using just one diameter and all elements are mounted on top of that meaning you know as a schematic is fine but mm, that's not close to reality so if i wanted to check something close to reality for example let's see if i kind of brought it here in one of these pictures no but at least we can see here you know for example we have this bevel gear and then this other the pinion the gear and you see that there is a, there are changes in the diameter of the of the shaft here you know so there, there is a, a difference so how do i choose this diameter how do i choose it, this diameter so th there are differences here and it starts from the practical point of view so for example, you know that you are going to have, have, for this case, for example, a couple of bearings, probably, and a couple of gears, probably. So let, let's consider that there are gears and the, well, you call it pulleys, well, but but let's consider that there are pulleys or gears or something mounted on that. So first, bearings. 
bearings have, when, when you look at bearings as you know, in the catalogs and everything, bearings have, you know, a determined specific diameters. I mean, when they manufacture bearings, they don't, I mean, imagine that you get a calculation for this shaft and this, the diameter of this shaft, you know, say, okay, you, according to your calculations is 53 millimeters. So first, you're not going to find any 53 millimeters uh, dia uh, bearing to mount there. So it's not, it's not because diameters are manufactured in a very uh, standardized way meaning that you know yeah you could find maybe 50 millimeters diameter bearing or you can find 55 millimeters but you're not going to five find you know 53 at all so then what's your decision yeah i have a question here yeah sorry this is just a more general question is this lecture yeah. going to be about shaft design or is this just a recap it's a recap yeah okay all right thank you yeah, we are not going to do this actually, but I want you to, to give you the idea of how it is gone, you know, how it is done. So in this case, so we have you no know, diameter, so you have to pick one. So which one of these is going to, to be selected for your applications? This is the 50 diameter, 50 millimeter diameter, or the 55 millimeter diameter. So it depends on then another type of calculation that you have to do on, on bearings to see which bearings. Uh, let's say number or um, or even type you are going to select for your applications. But let's imagine that you select you no know, 55 because you know 53 is the minimum, and then but then this very bearing is going to be 55 millimeters, and then this is going to become you know a larger shaft. But again, you cannot have a larger shaft here, so you have to extend it the whole way around. And so, and then. You're going to use a bearing here, and that means that that bearing has certain conditions for mounting the bearing on top of this. So as you see here, in this case for the 50, this is a 50 millimeter diameter K6. So K, K6 corresponds to the tolerances of this diameter, because when you are going to bring a bearing here, that bearing says, okay, uh, I'm going to be installed there, so I need to be installed with certain fitting, with certain tolerances. So the bearing that you're going to bring here, for example, is going to be uh, 50 millimeters and then uh, M6 something, you know, uh, tolerances. And then you start, you start defining the, the diameter of the shaft by selecting, you know, the nominal measurement plus, you know, certain tolerances because you know that there is going to be H, a bearing mounted here. And not only that, but you know the surface where you're going to mount that has to have certain you know characteristics. For example, this is required to be polished. So that's another thing. That's another field. That's another let's say uh, knowledge that you have to include in this whole process of shaft design. Besides that, you know here you have this sign kind of concentricity meaning that or centricity let's put it in parallelism well this is parallelism and this is centricity is that you know that these have to have certain manufacturing conditions when you are producing this shaft or, or you know taking this shaft to the lathe and then you are machining this so it's something that is let's say very detailed uh is not just saying that you know the minimum diameter is this but when we are designing shafts uh, we need to take into account so many factors in here that uh, sometimes it feels overwhelming. So just by looking at this figure here in this part, so you can see that there is a lot of attention or, or detail to attention paid here. Even these things here. So why uh, in the transition between one diameter to the another diameter, there has to be this. And if you remember kind of from a couple of weeks back, we we're talking about stress concentration factors. So mainly done, this is done to alleviate those stress concentrations that are produced for the, say, the rapid change of diameter in one section. And this is already, let's say, tabulated. So you need to go to tables and pick those kind of 
uh, say what's the groove, what the the width of the groove, and everything. And also this, you know, why do I have to use a bevel here? I kind of is a, I believe it's chamfer is a, a way of bevel, the bevel here. So why do I have to have this specific thing at the end of the shaft, kind of something like this? Let me try it better. That doesn't. That is not mentioned in any part of the design on this part here. So, and then you say, okay, but why? So, and then you know, in the end, you're going to have definitely a come a different, let's say, sections with different diameters in your design, and then that it seems that you know the design of a shaft is not just straightforward as kind of mentioned here. So. Uh, just to leave you with that note, I kind of was hoping that you were going to see this in a future uh, subject, but it seems that it's not presented, as at least I couldn't find it, because this is a, an interesting, let's say, type of uh, learning activity where you're starting from one idea and then you are, let's say, creating these kind of shapes. And uh, just to not take a moment to, to look at this, maybe you already did because you, you have this material, but, you know, uh, one thing is that you just see this picture and say, well, what the, what the teacher wanted to say with this, and then now what I'm telling you is that, you know, there's a lot of activities involved in going from one place to another. So imagine that. You have to consider, you know, how you are going to assemble the elements, how you are going to uh, uh, manufacture this shaft. So, yeah, you can have certain diameters, but what are the commercial diameters that are available for this piece of steel, you know? Oh, well, you know, should I use this? Or what's the one that is more convenient to use? So this sign of the keyways and everything. So take into account that, take it as a kind of, if you didn't, let's say, stop and thought about what was the purpose of having these two things, even though it's mentioned in the, in the, in the paragraph on the top, so, but there is a lot, there is a lot to, to be done here. And, and imagine this, you know, this uh, rounding here. So why, why it has to be rounded? So again, you know, why in this way? So how much information do I need to, do to get to the, to the level that I can design this? A machine, uh, uh, find element software can give you, can take you to the point where you, let's say, determine if the shaft or certain measurement or diameter of a shaft is going to fail or not, and how much is the deflection. But to take to this creative part of you know, shaping the shaft and adding all of these nomenclature on top of that, uh, I hope I would like to see something like that. I believe there are some things that are automated, but uh, I believe we're far, well, we're far from that. And this corresponds to the main, let's say, it's a main job of a designer to come up with these ideas. For sure, there are many shafts if designs designed, so you can have some references, but still, you know, you have to consider many, many things on shaft design. However, in this, in this, subject we're going just to take it in the basic level yeah what questions do you have right. then I mentioned here the design of a shaft and you know beams is more or less the steps are pretty similar with the differences that we're, well, we're going to touch on differences here but the main difference being being for us is that uh, beams are not going to be subjected to torque shaft on the other way on the other hand is they are going to be subjected to torque and we were going to consider in the design of beams that these are going to be merely static designs so so we can say that they are simpler to design than shafts, but they have certain considerations that you know we haven't even seen here. For example, consider in, in this figure here, 
that in the design of, of beams, it's not only that you're going to design, you know, what's the size of the beam that you need here, so it, it accomplished the, you know, the mission here, but also the design corresponds to how you are going to join the, that beam to the column and, you know, how this joint is going to interact with the other joints and so on. So it's not as simple as, you know, just, you know, say, ah, yes, the size is this, but, you know, you have to consider this. And I believe these are, these are the ones that are, let's say, not painful, but, you know, time consuming in that sense, you know, that you have to make sure that you have a very good, let's say, joint, because uh, the integrity of the whole structure is going to be depending not only on the size, but on the joining that you're going to have. You know, is it going to be welded? Why? Is it going to be bolted? You know, why? Uh, you know, welded has certain characteristics, has certain, let's say, manufacturing facilities. Uh, bolted, on the other hand, might be more expensive, but, you know, more simpler to, to assemble. And, uh, you don't require that many specialists, you know, like weld welders and stuff. So it's a trade, it's a balance between many factors when you are designing. So I feel that when we are teaching these subjects, you know, we are isolating that much the design that we make people think that, you know, design is just that simple. It's something that is just one individual element. But in, in reality, when we are designing or when performing mechanical design, uh, we not only have to see what's happening with the individual element, but we have to see how that individual element is going to interact with the rest and how it's going to connect, mechanically connect with the rest. So uh, on the other hand, if you see here in this uh, material, it was that the beam design, you are actually not designing a beam, but you are somehow, let's say, what is it? Maybe if I put it in the back, but maybe it's repeating that you, know, you are selecting a beam. So it's not that you are designing something from zero. No, no, you are just selecting something that is commercially available. So you have thousands of available beam sizes, models, kind of shapes that you can select from for your design according to your calculations. I mean, you know, as I mentioned in some of these, uh, in these uh, writings here is that designing a beam is like, you know, having a shopping list and going to, you know, to shop for the correct, you know, beam for your application. Also difference in, in this case was that uh, we are going mostly to treat beams as in the planar case, while in, in shafts, you know, most probably we're going to have a three-dimensional case. So, and um, that's mainly because we are going to have certain elements that produce that, that produce uh, uh, forces in different directions. So that's something to take into account there. Now, any questions so far? So far? Good. So in this case, uh, let's assume that kind of in the first part of the lecture or this lecture I posted, uh, I tried to list a series of steps to you know, to carry out the calculation or, or the design, let's put it in that way, of beams and shafts. Uh, with the again, with the difference is that you no, know, when we're talking about Beams, you know, we're not going to consider any torque or anything like that. So one of the steps is going to be, let's say, uh, jumped or you no know, skipped. That's it. Yeah. And also, I mentioned that yeah, we will. You can, we can be talking about uh, a couple of things. So I said that designing beams is like. Going, you know, using a you go, go in for shopping and then you know finding the the right beam according to your let's say to your design. So what's a commercial beam that adapts to your design? But um, it's not rare that you would have to really design a beam like you see in this picture here. So it has basically the same shape as commercial ones, but sorry, but sizes are different, and then. These are the cases where you are, you actually need to design 
kind of you know, mechanically the shape of the beam and see how much is going to know, how high. So what are the dimensions of the web of the beam? The web being being this this part here, and what are the dimensions of the flange here? So how thick, how wide? So and also selecting the material for those purposes. So yeah, there are cases where you would have to design the beam, but uh, the criteria you would use to design the beam are those similar to the one that you use to select a beam. So there shouldn't be any major, let's say, comp complications while designing the beam. Now, there is a following step here that you see that the beam, this beam has to be constructed, fa fabric, uh, fabricated. So you have some welding here. So is the design is the kind of the task of the designer to instruct kind of design the welding for for those beams also kind of you know what is the what is the welding uh, what are the welding parameters you are going to let's say use to manufacture that beam you know what are the dimensions of that weld uh, what type of material you are going to use for the welding so it, it really becomes a, a total a complete design pro, uh, issue in this sense. And also, it was mentioned somewhere here that uh, in the case of even beams or shafts, uh, we are going to ignore the actual uh, kind of uh, forces. Kind of, we're going to say no, they are going to be considered you know, not critical. However, if you see shafts like these bevel gears here, uh, because of the way bevel gears work, you know, the angles that the teeth are aligned to. So it generates a an actual force here. And from a shaft standpoint, you know, it might not be a big deal to have the shaft, but you still have to, let's say, consider that force and see how that force would influence in the deformation of the shaft. And also, and we need to be aware that you know we're going to have elements mounted on this shaft, for example, let's consider a bearing, and that bearing is going to have a, let's say, some kind of tolerances to the actual force applied to them. So yes, uh, uh, an actual force on a shaft might be of merely or barely influenced on the design, Kind of, but we still need to check, you know, if the force is something that is going to contribute to the deformation of the shaft, and also we need to calculate it anyways because when whatever we mount on on the shaft, you know, we need to consider that what's going to happen. What are the, for example, it's bearing requirements. So we need to calculate it and then you know, consider it itself or keep it, you know, keep track of that forces there, or those forces there. Did you find out any kind of uh, doubt or say comments to add to, to this first set of slides? Sharing and share the other one. And as I mentioned here, that by the way, I found a couple of mistakes that I hope that somebody would point out. I won't, I won't, I will tell you where the mistakes are. And if you want to kind of, you know, try to find it out and tell me what is it, uh, please do it. But please don't, don't go fishing with the mistakes, you know, because one of the latest emails uh, last kind of last week from one student. So he, uh, he, uh, he asked, Hey, uh, there, there seems to be something here, isn't it? 
So that's not the way to point out mistakes. You know, if you are pointing out a mistake, you know, state clearly, hey, I think there is a mistake with this number. It should be something, you know. But you know, going fishing, kind of saying, hey, I think in slide number something there should be some mistake, uh, isn't it? No, no, that's not the way to point out mistakes. You know, so just. So in the sense, I'm going to tell you where the mistakes are, and then I would let you, you know review and you know come come up with the saying saying hey you know it's because of this, and then you know, and then you know you can get the points. And important thing is that or <laughs> that a mistake is done in one slide, and then and the next slide is corrected, but it was never let's say re recorrected or let's put it in that way in this slide where the mistake was but anyway so these are kind of what you see here in this uh, beam example is the typical problem you're going to find in in beam design so first you're going to have some sort of diagram such as this uh you're going to have you know usually all of these data you're going to have you no know, span of the wind of the beam you're going to have you know what loads are on on the beam and they're going to ask you, hey, uh, they can ask you a couple of things, but the most, let's say, the most common questions you're going to be asked are, for example, okay, what's the beam that does the job to use? And that usually refers to, hey, uh, what are what what the commercial beams are which are available? Could we use that would do the job in this loading situation and that's that's kind of the, the first and most common questions you're going to get and actually when you go to the engineering field you know you go to the practice basically it's that so you're given a, a loading case and this loading case you know is going to be matched against you know commercial beam and then you're going to say this is the beam we're going to use and second is to determine what's going to be the deformation of the beam And why it is important to determine the deformation of the beam. So imagine that this is a structure member and you have installed, you have mounted on top of that. Let's see that these are not six meters, but you know, these are 20 meters. And you have, for example, a motor here. And you have a gearbox. Um, let's imagine that this is a bridge crane, for example. When this beam deforms, what's going to happen is that these elements are going to deform also. So the, this pump, this motor is going to deform like this, and this uh, gear box is going to deform like this. So you're going to be affecting, for example, what's happening in the coupling. So all possible requirements for the coupling to work are going to be lost. Secondly, you're going to be imposing stresses on the shafts because of the deformation, and that shaft is going to be imposing stresses if this is a motor in bearings here. And then if it is a gearbox, it's going to be imposing stresses not only in the bearings, but also in the gear contact between the, you know, the, the gear, yeah, the gearbox contacts, you know, gear to gear, gear to wheel contact here. And then you are going to, as a consequence of those incremented stresses, then you are going to, let's say, accelerate the failure of those components. Components such as this, mechanical components are doomed to fail. They will fail. They will fail, you know, in five years, 20 years, or n number of years, you know, but they will fail because that's the characteristics of any mechanical component. They are going to fail. It's our job to, as an engineer, as engineers, to determine when they're going to fail or how to avoid the failure to a certain level and, you know, kind of do things around them so we minimize that possible failure but they're they going to fail at some point they're going to fail but if we don't then we if we don't keep track of this deformation that we need to have in beams then you know we may create that kind of problems and calculating the deformation is not a big issue 
So you can do it. There are, there are several techniques to calculate the formation of pins. The issue is defining what's the deformation, the, what's the maximum deformation you need to have on, on the, well, in, in those arrangements, in, in, in those beams. And that's the problem. For example, here in this example, I kind of, I, I asked you to, for example, calculate uh, what would be the beam to, you know, to support all those loadings, but also what would be the beam that, you know, doesn't deflect more than 21 millimeters. So 21 millimeters of deformation on a, in a kind of an, a six meter span, is that uh, good? Is that bad? So that's the most difficult decisions as engineers that we can have. So on the one hand, we could use standards and in many standards for structures of you know, building constructions or, or structures dedicated to, for example, holding the, the, the same bridge cranes or any kind of you know, warehouse structures or per se or something like that, they would tell you, hey, you know what? Uh, the, the formation of the beam cannot be more than this. And usually the deformation of the beam is related to the spam of the beam, meaning that there is a is the deformation divided by the length of the beam. So basically, uh, what is given is that it's a, you know the deformation cannot be more than this many times, you know, the length of the beam. And then you take the length of the beam, multiply, you know, by that uh, factor, and that would tell you what's the maximum deformation you are going to you need to consider there. Now there would be an interesting case. So okay, what about if the design that I'm doing or I'm creating is something new that there are no standards for that? So how would I consider what's the maximum deformation of a of a beam or of a shaft? And basically, the answer to that question is that the maximum deformation that you can have in any structure, kind of beam or shaft, is going to be determined by the maximum deformation allowed in the internal components of the elements that are going to be mounted on that element or that shaft on that beam and then they're going to be subjected to that formation let me try to draw an example here so imagine that you have a shaft and the shaft deforms in this way exaggeratedly and on top of the shaft you have bearings or mounted on the shaft you have bearings But however, that shaft is located in a, in a in a casing, yeah. So you have a casing, something, and that casing or where it supported some is straight. Kind of this is these are the supports of this. And then you're going to have the other part of the bearing, which is going to be forced to be aligned with the upper part. In here. And then you have the rolling elements. Let's put uh, they are these are these are all bearings. Let's assume that. If you come to this case that there is no standards you not know, telling you how much usually you're going to find a standard you know for example for pumps they're going to well you know the deformation of a, of a shaft the, the shaft of a pump shouldn't be lo larger than this or an industrial fan or you know a gearbox or a electrical motor you're going to have some standards but in the case that you don't find that because you're designing something totally new then you have to ask the designer of the element you are going to be mounting there and say okay what's the maximum angle that you can tolerate here and then that maximum angle that you can tolerate here something like this is the one that you're going to be using to calculate what's going to be the maximum deformation of this shaft as an example and the premise for this as i mentioned in the past is that when we study in the university these kind of things, we see it as isolated term, isolated applications. Uh, but when you start looking at, you know, having a, a burst view picture and a high level, uh, let's say, overview of what's happening with your design, they say, okay, 
whatever I do in this side of the design is going to affect this other side of the design. So this is the way that you can answer you know, this, type of, this type of questions by looking at how does it affect to the rest of the components. And if those rest of the components have certain limitations, then you better take into account that for the design of everything. So that's the way uh, I have been thinking as a designer and you know, it pays off. It really pays off to do it in that way. What questions do you have? All right, so then in this case was something like that. So we have a beam, it's a typical, say, beam design. You have all the data you need to calculate that beam. Let me just clean a little bit this. Is there a way they could? Easier. Then it, it just has, you know, tell me what's something I need to use and, and guarantee that the deflection is not going to be larger than 21 millimeters. And everything starts from here, you know, the step free body diagram. And now, one of the reasons I wanted to come back to this topic, even though you had access to this material beforehand, is that you're not going to believe me. This step here, calculating the reactions of a simple beam, like it was presented in the exam, that you have access to the exam, the old exam, was the play is where 90% of the students failed. People couldn't calculate correctly the reactions of a simple supported beam or a beam, like an example of the exam or the exercise presented in the exam. And if you have this wrong, everything you do is going to be wrong. So no need to check anything else. I might understand that you know this has become very calculating the reactions of a force. First, it's something that nowadays you have many calculators that are able to perform that you know in the internet, and that does fabulous. However, in, at this stage, when you're asked to calculate these reactions, you better do it correctly, you know, and you take your time to do you know your force sum and your moment moment sum and stuff, and you do your counts right, and you know that's something that you need to 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 take care of you know, at this stage. And this was one of the points where, uh, as I mentioned, almost 90% of people fail, and it was not difficult to get, but they just messed it up with this stuff. And it, it just, it was wrong, and that, that was it, it was a mistake. So just pay attention to this, just, you know, go over it, because even myself, I, I have to admit that, you know, when I see these kind of problems, I would say, ah, yeah, this is easy, but if I spend, a long time without doing these kind of exercises, you know, I'm going to be in trouble later to try to figure out oh, how much was it this, how should I calculate this, or and then or, or I get mistaken with that, you know, with signs and stuff. But you know, just you know, pay attention to this part because this was one of the weakest points uh, that I found in the in the example in the exam. Good. Then the first you see here is just you know you consider the load and then you you calculate the the free body diagram you know, of this shaft, of this beam, you know, according to that loading. One important thing here to consider for us also from the design standpoint is that uh, be careful with the with the supports. So, and more importantly, be careful with the degrees of freedom these supports provide. Who doesn't know who is what is a degree of freedom? And don't be ashamed to say, I don't know what the hell is that. Everybody's aware of what a degree of freedom is. All right. Silence, I would consider that everybody is aware of that. Degrees of freedom 
are going to tell me which type of reactions are going to be appearing here. So for this specific case, there is no a rotation degree of freedom, meaning that no reaction moments are going to appear here. However, in the example we looked at, let me bring it back. This one here. I wonder, can we recognize what type of degree of freedom this voltage connection uh, produces? Is it fixed? Can bolts allow rotation? Or are they considered a fixed uh, connection or joint? Because heads up, if we as designer consider simple cases to, the, to, to select the beam and all the formation, and then when we go to the practical design, we come up with this, then we are doing something wrong. So heads up with this, because you know we need to be consistent with what we consider at the schematic level and what we do at the you know, complete design level. So that's why here you're going, you're not going to see any reaction moments because if we have reaction moments here, you know the situation is going to be completely different. But now, but this is pretty easy. You know, you calculated these uh, these reactions, and then you know you start producing your shear force diagram and bending moment diagram. And also, you have seen this. You, know, you have studied this. You have practiced in this. And there shouldn't be any issues, you know, constructing these type these types of diagrams. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Now you start kind of according to this, you start kind of selecting where are the places where the maximum uh, force is applied and where the maximum moment is applied. And definitely, when you see these charts, you know, it's pretty clear. That you know these charts are useful because you know graphically you can see well if everything is done at scale I know that this is the largest moment I'm going to have and then if it's, this is done at scale this is going to be the largest shear force we're going to have. Now I want to I want to talk to your common sense. So I said that the maximum shear force is 62 kilonewtons, but what happens here? These are clearly 90 kilonewtons, the, the point to point. I'm going to leave this question open to you so for your reflection. So shouldn't be that or, or should, should I consider those 90 kilonewtons as maximum shear force or not? I'm just going to leave it, you know, for your own thoughts because it's really interesting, you know. Because if I'm trying to see graphically what's the value of those shear forces, then you know these questions should have should have come at some point, you know, in your in your mind. But yeah, but what happens here? You know, not even now, but before. Why 62? Why not 90? Because 90 is is definitely applied there. But why? Consider this. Then having those two values, basically, we go shopping. This time, you know, I just selected a, a, an IP beam profile, but you know, it can be any other depending on what you want to use. Oh, and, and again, uh, during the design process, it's not that for you know. Imagine that you are you are designing a structure, of, uh, a, a massive structure, or part of the design team that uh, that is designing a, this, a, this, a big structure. So you have to consider also, you know, what type of beam shapes are being used so you don't incur into, let's say, overbind things that you're not going to need. For example, if every if in the design it, it is decided that you're going to use this IPE beam shape, then you know uh, you try to look for solutions using IPE beam shapes, or you know, 
it's not that you're going to go wildly shopping for whatever you know accomplishes your, your the work you're, you're trying to accomplish so so that's something that you need to take into account so not only yeah you're, you you have the freedom to select out of many being profiles but you need to select those being profiles that are used according to the whole you know, uh, design process of, of of the project you're working on then you no know, this is a commercial table you are going to find variations even for the same type of profile so so slight variations but there are variations and then if you find the commercial tables from one manufacturer and then you compare that to the same type of beam profile to another manufacturer there are going to be differences so but it's important that you you use for your design purposes uh, the manufacturer that you basically are going to buy from because you know and, and again these are statistical measures as we discussed with the failure theory thing you know the yield stress these are statistical measures this is the average of things so of course you know we are not going to be deeper into you know what are the, the standard deviations of these of these values here so how should i consider you know, uh, let, let, let's agree that we will use the the average of those values and those average are presented on this in this table or so and, and that's it you no know? but when you go shopping for beam beams that could you know do your the job you're, you wanted to do so you look search for two things area and section modules that's it and you say well these are the beams this is the area properties and these are the section modules okay so what do i do now well let's see then we have one calculation we need to do which is we need to calculate what's the the section minimum section section modules modules we need to have using the moment we found and the the allowable stress yield stress of the material which is presented at the beginning in here which corresponds to the material of the beam that we are using right now and then that's going to give you the minimum uh, uh, section modulus and then you are going to be scouting for that value in this table in this case the minimum section modulus was 644 time over three and then you see well this is too little this is the one so coincidentally coincidentally in this table i would need to use to withstand the bending moment so it doesn't yield this ip330 up to this point many people would leave the calculation and that's it you just selected a beam that does the job and that's it and then Again, what, what is this answering? This is basically the answer that the beam is not going to yield. It's not going to deform, you know, beyond the yielding point. This is the answer of that question. And it is basically a one-to-one -one comparison. So you're not applying any, we're going to see later, but you're not applying any failure theories on this. You're just seeing, this is the minimum, give me something that is larger than the minimum, and that's it. Now, yeah, I have a the question. Yeah, please. Uh, yeah, so my question is uh, about just uh, this section modulus. Can yeah. you uh, briefly remind what does it uh, describe, basically? Because I, if uh, some of the um, uh, definitions I found the, on the internet is they basically say that it's the direct measure of like kind of the beam strength, but I'm still not sure what is the physical meaning of that value. Does that make sense? Oh, sorry, I think you're 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 muted.
I believe it should be okay now. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah because I, I'm using the browser Teams browser and I lost the where where was it? So yeah, this is a okay. So let's check out this formula. This is a geometrical a, a geometry measure. So you have forces, you have stresses, you have geometry. So this is just a geometrical measure, and, and it's a, it's just a relationship between you know. For example, if you look for how it, it is determined or calculated for complex shapes, it would be something like relate, relating what's the moment of inertia and what is the let's say the neutral axis of the of the beam. Yeah. So it's basically something that comes out of the geometry. So physical is that a, a geometric measure, nothing else. So it doesn't have any kind of implications, but it just measure, measures our relations between two, two geometric parameters of, of the beam in that sense. Is that enough, Kenya, for as an explanation? Yeah, I think so. So basically, the, um, could we say that the bigger the um, section modulus, the, the, the stronger the beam would be? Yeah, yeah, let's put it that way. And you can relate it with this, for example, in the, in the calculation, when we want to select a beam, we select a beam that has a larger, uh, let's say, section modulus than the resource you are getting. Hence, uh, the larger the, the section modulus, you know, the more the more resistant is going to be the beam for this building case. Let's put it in that way. Okay, but, thank you. Yeah. yeah, but basically, you know, when you have this tri tri triad of you know geometry, force, and and stress. So this is a geometric measure, so only like that, you know, and it just measures. So, for example, if you have an I-beam, so and this is the neutral axis that is coincident with the centroidal axis, then you know you say, well, okay, what's the relation between this one and then the, the whole inertia of the beam? And basically, it's that. Now, now let's come to this part. Knowing the actual beam, we calculate the shear stress using its section area. Okay. In this slide, there is a mistake. And I just you know if you can take notes, so the mistake is here. And uh, so you can try to find out oh, where's the mistake, you know. But uh, anyway. So from a real application point of view, and let me t let me try to bring up a figure. Uh, I'm just trying to look for a figure. For a for a kind of cylindrical shaft to fail in shear. The forces needed are are really really obscene. So let me bring this one here. We'll delete this. So this is an example of a column that is joined to the ground using this pin here. Yeah. yeah. The diameter of this beam compared to the force it can support is is obscene. So meaning that you know you don't need to have uh, you know bigger uh, you know the sizes of that element are really meaning it's difficult that it, it just shears it just fades by shearing. You know it's it's hardly difficult. That's why you are going to see you know huge structures and then when you see the joint points you know there are really small diameters so how they can withstand the whole you know force or loading you know this because you know they can do it in, in the area they you know the shearing they can they can do it and that's why i mentioned that this type of uh, in this type of exercises uh, people just leave the you know the solution up to this point here and this is it you know i calculated i selected the section modulus and that's it uh, but then I wanted to continue to con continue you know, constructing this because this is also that you could consider important. So you can calculate the the shear stress caused by the by this uh, let's say uh, shear force 
which compared to any other thing is very small. Then, you know, well, I just say here that, you know, where are those maximum stresses on that? So you can read this one. And the thing is that when you have the bending moment already calculated with the moment that you, the, the bending stress is calculated with the bending, maximum bending moment, and then the maximum shear stress, even though they are not occurring maybe at the same part, but you can consider, you know, as an example. And then you transform those values by using a more circle, or you can use the formula straight, straight formula to calculate what are the principal, maximum principal stresses. And you see that usually maximum principal stresses are not that, uh, let's say, far away from what the maximum bending stress you know, found in the in your calculation is going to be. And then if you use that to calculate, you know, to use any bending theory or, or any failure theory, so in the end, you know, that's why you don't continue doing this. You don't proceed, you know, doing this kind of stuff. You just, you know, stop there and, and say, well, this is the beam I'm going to use. And then you proceed to the calculations of, of deformation. Additionally, depending on the size of the beam and magnitude of the loads, you know, you might need to consider the weight of the beam, the self weight, as part of the you know, uniformly distributed load that you are using in your example. So it depends. So it depends. So when to consider when not. So so that's a good you know, question that has practical implications in the sense that it's not a strong rule. But if you want to be sure, please include the weight of the of the beam in your calculations as a normally distributed load. And I believe you can find it somewhere here, kind of uh, here, weight in meter, in kilo, kilograms per meter. So, so definitely, you know, you have to be rational and say, well, you know, this is six kilo, kilograms per meter uh, in a six meter span. So that's going to be, well, let's put 10 meter span is going to be 60 kilometers. We can be 600 newtons if we put it in the way. So and by the way, when you apply you no know, forces of thousand or more newtons, you might charge, you know, well, not 600 newtons. So and you apply a force of a thousand, then you know you might be considering the safe weight, or you might need to consider that safe weight there. So that's important to, to see also there. Yeah, but that's why, you know, in, in beam design, we don't go further to apply Tresca or bone misses because actually uh, you are not going to find a very different result from applying just a direct direct comparison of what's the section modulus that you need with the, what's the section modulus available to the to the to these uh, let's say commercial tables. And actually you straight away if you divide this section modulus here, the one they're going to use. Uh, by this one here that you're that's the minimum you require you're going to, you're going to get some safety factors that you could use also in your calculations to select the beam so uh, many possibilities here you have great and now it comes the tricky part deflection of the beam so there are few methods to, well, not a few, some methods to calculate the flexions of the beam. I have chosen for this course to use the McCulloch's, 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 McCulloch's method to, to calculate the deflection of the beam. And one of the reasons I chose this method, method uh, based, uh, it was based on the fact that uh, this is one of the methods that you could implement in, in MATLAB or Python or any other software. And you will be able to use the formulas and calculate the deflection of a beam in any point of a beam. So that's why I chose this method. Uh, it's very particular. It's based on two principles. The first one are uh, what is called discontinuity functions and singularity functions. So it sounds uh, difficult, but the implementation is pretty straightforward. And I left there is this example here, and I left one video for you to check uh, of one other example where how the procedure goes. But I will walk through this part. And when you hear the word, the fancy words about you know uh, discontinuity fun functions and singularity functions, basically think of this: these are functions that either they act or not depending on the position of the of what you are interested on on the beam. So, for example, if you would use the method of double integration of the beam to calculate the deflection, which it is one of the most popular methods you are going to be using or you use, 
and it's very popular because it's a straight derivation of you know kind of double integrating the, the moment that you obtain you know for these places uh it's fine you can use it but when you start having complex loading cases it became it becomes really uh cumbersome to use the double integration method because as a quick example for this case if i would use the double integration method for this formula i would obtain about one two three formulas and then if i wanted to know what's the deformation in this point for example i would have to use the formula corresponding to that point so i would have to divide the length of the beam into intervals where forces are applied or, or, or let's say, or the changes of moment are acting. So I could use you know, several, let's say, formulas. So in this case, you are going to end up with at least three formulas to calculate deflection and depending on where you want the deflection, so you will have to choose that formula. Now with Macaulay's, what happened is that you're going to have just one formula and that formula, uh, you could put it in a computer and then you're going to get the graph of the whole beam or you can straight, you know, ask to, to Macaulay's, hey, what's going to be the deformation at 2.5 meters from the left? And it's going to tell you, well, it's this much. Because, you know, using this discontinuity and singularity functions, uh, some functions are going to be active or not, depending on what you consider. And the implementation in Excel, for example, is pretty straightforward and simple. This is an example. So definitely you start by the free body diagram and kind of as a quick recap of this what you do is that you just section the beam in in a place where you are considering most of the loads loads on the beam so that's why it's cut there and when you make that cut what's going to happen is that you're going to have a moment a reactive moment appearing here and that reactive moment is going to be the foundation to construct kind of the Macaulay's you know, equation in this sense. Just as well. Now, this is typical. So you have the reactive moment in here. You have the moment caused by the this reaction. You have the moment caused by the uniform distributed load, you have the moment caused by the point load, and then you have the moment caused by the other reaction. And that has to be equal to zero because you no, know, this is a balanced uh, system and then it's not moving static. So it's all, let's say, in equilibrium. Now, we are not using parentheses here. We're using brackets. And we are using brackets to signal that something special is happening here with these things and this is where the equations that turn on turn off or well what i mentioned that something turned on and turns off you know happens is because you know it's indicated by these macaulay's brackets so look how the distances are represented here so well yes you know uh this this if i say well i make the cut here and then the whole distance is going to be X, then I can start defining the application points of each one of these loads according to this X that is going to be the distance of or the length of my remaining segment here. So this is pretty clear. So that this is not depending on X, so this 2.7. Now to go from C to the cut, to the section cut is going to be, well, X minus 2.7. So this is pretty clear also. Uh, the distance between uh, supports is also not depending on X, it's fixed. But then this is going to be x minus 6. So that's why this is formed in this way. Because what Macaulay says in a nutshell is that if I start calculating the deformation of this beam from this point, from this point in this direction, you know, I can ask what's the deformation of this, 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 and that. As soon as I hit this spot here, the this force is going to start contributing to the deformation of the beam. And then I need to consider that force. And then I, I start, let's say, well, this is the deformation, what's the deformation? When I come here, then when I hit this spot, then this force start, is going to start this, uh, contributing to the deformation of the beam and so on. That's why this is represented in brackets. And that's why you're going to see later that some terms 
apply to certain distances and those operations apply doesn't apply to certain distances. So in here, for example, it is said that the brackets, Macaulay brackets of you know the, the uniformly distributed load are removed. So because the uniform uniform distributed load are is acting on the whole extent of the beam, so it doesn't turn on or turns off or not turn off. So you just have it there all the time. But in this case, of the point load of 90 kilonewtons, for example, if I ask, okay, what's the what's the deformation at 2.5 meters? If I put 2.5 meters here, this is going to result in minus 0 0.2 meters. I don't, that's why this is nothing used there. So this load, if I use it under this premise, is telling me that it is helping not to deform form the, the load and that's not the case so this what is telling is that if this if this is this the result of this this operation here is negative so don't take it only take whatever is the maximum and i mean if i wrote it later between zero and you know and x minus 2.7 that's it there is no other way so if this term here is negative so consider zero and this is going to be zero so there is not going to be contribution of this load to the to the deformation but if this term is positive so this becomes the maximum so we can you know it, it contributes to the deformation that's why this formula can be implemented in exam pretty pretty say straightforward what questions do you have All right. Yeah, again, we do here a double integration. So we first integrate, you know, one time. Well, we firstly substitute this moment by the uh, Euler Bernoulli convention here. Well, yeah, something like that, similar to that. And we do a first integration with, you know, which brings us this first integra integration constant, and then a second integration, which brings us brings us a second integration constant. With the first integration, with the, the second integration, we are going to be able to get the value of the formation. Why? Well, represented by why. With the first integration, we are going to be able to determine this. And this is going to be relating to this as the uh, slope of this. That was the word I used, slope. And with the slope, I'm going to be able to determine the, the rotation angle or the angle caused by that deformation. Then as a procedure, this is a procedure that you can follow you know, step by step all the time. So. You consider the the boundary conditions and the supports because those are known conditions for your formula that is you know i know that here there's not going to be any deformation so y is going to be zero and here i also know that it's not going to be any deformation so y is going to be zero also yeah i cannot say the same about rotations or anything because definitely this one of the degree of freedoms allowed by these supports are the rotation around a, a z axis or an axis perpendicular to the to the plane of this beam but i have a couple of boundary conditions i have a couple of equations which i could use them to calculate what are the, the value of the constants in this case you know just constant one i believe was the, the one who got the, the one value and then with this formula this is this is the formula you, you could use then to or these are the formulas that you could use to plot you know, slopes and deformations in Excel, if you want to, without going too further to any more sophisticated software. Then you ask the question about, okay, uh, if I want to compare that the maximum deformation is not larger than 21 millimeters, so where should I test that? So should I test it in the whole in the whole uh, let's say in the whole extent of the beam definitely we know that you know maximum moments are applied here 
So we could assume that this is going to be more or less the point where the maximum uh, deformation is going to be, you know, present, presented, yeah. And then you can just pinpoint that uh, value and say, okay, please, you know, use the formula to tell me what's the maximum deformation in, at 2.7 meters from the, from the left. Now, there is an important question here. So what about if this is too complex and I don't want to rely on just visually seeing or assuming that this is the maximum point. So how could I do to calculate the maximum deformation in, uh, in, on the stain of the beam or along the beam uh, without trying to you know, guess where, where is the maximum deformation? Well, you can simply come back here and Actually, you can, you can come here to this formula here and make it equal to zero. And then find a place where X full kind of meets this condition. Because as you know, if you want to know what are the maximums of this uh, Y in the range of possibilities of these values of X, then what you do is to differentiate this with respect to the variable and then you just, you know, solve the, the question for that, and that's going to give you the X where um, the maximum or minimums are going to be appearing, and then you take those maximums or minimums, evaluate it back into this equation, and that's going to give you, let's say, the maximum, uh, which is the interest, the, the, the maximum deformation of the beam. That's the way it's done when you have a complex loading in this case, like this. But here it's kind of simpler. It's straightforward to see that it's going to be in this case. And then uh, I need to check this uh, result according to one comment I got that, you know, it might not be that. I tried to replicate this example uh, using online calculators. Yeah. And I got something like this. Let me place it here. So I will check it out, but at least the calculators, the online calculators, when I kind of use the same example, put it online, kind of in this, uh, there are a couple of websites that are, are great to do these calculations. And then I put the loads and everything, and the results that gave me was about 19.6 millimeters compared to this, or so one millimeter off. That may be depending on the decimals you're using and the method you're using. But seems to be aligned, but I will recheck, I promise I will recheck these values with all these numbers because it may be that these numbers doesn't lead to this one. So that might be an error also there. Yeah, Evgenia. Uh, yeah, just, uh, I'm not sure if you uh, referred to one of my emails as phishing. Uh, yeah, you're, work, you're, I didn't want to tell you, but yeah. Yeah, like I, I just, uh, I genuinely don't know if it's, me who is wrong or uh, like maybe there's a mistake because still I, I don't maybe understand everything. So I want to make sure this mm -hmm. to state that clearly. Uh, but anyway, for this why, uh, the major problem I had with this formula because it's for X equals 2.7 meters. Yeah. And when we substitute it into that formula and here we factor out this 61.90.593 divided by six, for some reason, even though in the brackets where there is X minus six, it would not equal to zero, that term. So can you explain to me why it's crossed there? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question. So do you understand why this 90 over six is uh, canceled out or? Yeah, or yeah, because I mean, X is 2.7, so it would go to zero. Yeah. So we are asking the, the way Macaulay's work is that you are going only to take into consideration those terms that can affect the results in the point you are using. So we are calculating the, def the deformation here, yeah, in this point. So this force is not acting, according to Macaulay's, is not contributing to that deformation because these brackets is not a straight, straight, let's say, 
subtraction of one to another. So the, we are using brackets to say, hey, if this is the if the result, yeah, is less than zero, then do not consider. Okay, that, was, that was clear. Yeah, now I understand it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that, that no, but that's a very good question because when I came here, uh, this is the formula that represents those brackets. So the maximum, the brackets, what is telling? Give me the maximum between either zero or the equation you have there. Or well, let's put it in this way x minus six. Yeah. If it's negative, this is not working. So that's why uh, Macaulay is working this way. That's why brackets are used here. It's just to let, let you know or let people know. No, this is not just that you, you're going to have this. Uh, you, you know, it works or doesn't work. So that's why they are called activation functions where you know the functions become active. So, and I want to repeat this because this is a pretty important concept that when you move from this side to this other side, asking questions about what are the Imagine that these are points where you are asking what's the deformation of, of the beam. And then when you start asking for these points here, you say, well, boom, here, in here, this force becomes active. And once the force becomes active, it remains active all along the, the rest of the calculation. So then you come here, you come here, come here. And when you come to this point, then this force becomes active and then you know, it stays active. So that's why it, at the beginning is a little bit weird to to graph the concept of these activation functions and you know, this continuity and then singularity. But after you get it, well, it, okay, that's it. No, that's the way it goes, uh, the math works. But, but that's a great question, yeah. Great. Any other question? All right. So, but again, no, but I will recheck because it's worth checking, you know, this, uh, this number in here, it might be something off. But according to these results, then, you know, yeah, it does, it's not going to deform more than 21 millimeters. So uh, it's, it's fine. So we can continue. And actually, this is kind of the formula applied in Excel. So you can have a continuous uh, line drawn by using just one formula. And here it is. Question so far? <coughs> Sorry. Let me share again. I'm still suffering from. Be sure. This one. Yeah. Now, now, can you see the shaft, the shaft design sample here? Yeah. Yeah, great. So, this is also worth noting and also reviewing this information. I found out that this example has, a, let's say, some not correct assumptions here. It's a valid example with valid conclusions. However, some approaches are not clear and there is something missing, very important missing here. That needs to be taken into account. If you can, you know, let me know that. I know already, so I will I will modify it, but I'm just giving you the opportunity to, to jump in and say, hey, no, it's because of this or because of the other thing. So, so you can get some points, but I already know where the, what's the main conception is or what is missing. Now, again, this is, a, this is an academic problem. You see a shaft of a just one diameter, which you're never going to find in industry, never. And you know, that, that was one of my mains. When I was a student, you know, it's amazing uh, when I told you that the body of knowledge of this subject hasn't changed in 100 years, basically. And the way it has been taught in universities, I believe it hasn't changed that much. Because I, the same examples you see now are the same examples I used when I was studying, and that was more than 25, 30 years ago. And you know, it seems that we haven't progressed on that. 
So I believe that a change is needed the way we focus the teaching of at least certain aspects of the theory in, in what is the strength of material or, or mechanics of materials and these, and these other topics, because uh, we need to be better prepared for 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 the job life, work life, you know, if we want to just hit the run, hit the hit hit the floor running in that sense, because it doesn't make sense to. I'm, I'm realizing this now that it doesn't make sense to have been teaching this type of exercises as they are, and we should be more proximate to reality, and that would make more sense. Yeah, something that we need to do. But the, the example is valid, and it, it's the same. And again, the main difference that you have here is that beams are not practically never subjected to torque. They are nothing as an application type. So in this case, you have a, a a shaft which is rotating at a certain with a certain power, and you know that's going to allow you to determine what's the torque uh, happening there. And uh, if you want to see how things are in reality, something like this resembles to something like this in the pictures. And if you ask me, okay, what is this? You know, where, where is this apply? Actually, this is part of a lathe, a machining machine tool, this machining tool that you use for. Let me bring up a picture for that. Machine tool. That's the the gearbox or speed changer i don't know what's I need to find the translation for that but speed changer or gearbox to change the speed of the machine lathe i'm going to bring just a second lathe. So this is a lathe, and okay, the word is spindle speed selector. Well, this is a what well, no, the whole this box here, uh, kind of, and this is the way that you change the rotational speed of the spindle here, and that's done by these type of mechanisms that you have in these cases. So you move these levers, these uh, knobs here, and some other, uh, let's say, lathe has, has different more possibilities to select. A speed, then you know, according to the machine part that you are using, the tool you are using to machine, then you have to rotate it at a certain speed to get a certain linear speed on the on the machine contact, and then that's why you select this. And this here is basically done by using this type of mechanism, which is valid. So you meaning that this resembles to this, and it could be possible that you are going to, at some point to design these machines. You know, it's highly possible there. <coughs> Sorry. Then forces are not going to be planar. So you're going to have three dimensional forces. You're going to have torque, and torque is going to be divided into stages. So that's why this example is pretty important here. Then when you do the three the free body diagram, the contacts that are going to happen between the gears are the ones who that are going to you know induce forces into the in, on the shaft, and those are the forces that you're going to use to calculate that you know, diameter of the shaft. This is where the the mistake is. Well, it starts basically. So take notes about this this slide because this is where the mistake starts and then uh when i notice this i say come on you know it, it does cannot be possible that i miss that uh it's a problem or or that detail because i used to work with these uh, systems a lot but uh, but they are here but the example is valid as a procedural example then this is something that is very important says that you know you have here the entrance of the torque so meaning the motor is is sending the torque and then you have a share of torque among you know this wheel here and this wheel here I meaning you have a motor here 
and then you know this is going to induce a torquing here and then you know the, there's some torque required here and there is some torque required here also then you know you have to consider that if you remember or you, as you are going to see in the figure theories about how a torque produces shear stresses on the element then you know you know that torque considering torque is important here but another situation is that you have no forces applied in one plane, you know, in the XY plane, and you have forces applied in, for example, in the XZ plane here. And that's going to produce, let's say, a type of bidimensional uh, shear force and moment uh, and bending moment diagram. And also you're going to have a pair of, of restrictions of, of uh, reactions here that you need to consider. So just as heads up, I'm not going to, th this is not, not going to the exam because it's kind of the reason this doesn't go to the exam is because it's not fun doing them. So this requires time, this requires carefulness, this requires, uh, let's say, that you are very uh, precise with things on how they are, but that's why I don't want to put that in the exam because it takes the fun out of solving these type of, of problems. But you're going to have I've already taken exercises about this. So and you have here the example on how the, the forces distribute, kind of according to the, how the, the torques distribute. You know, for example, how to use the power of the motor, how to use the speed of the motor to transform that into torque, and then that torque can be transformed back into forces into the elements. But it's practically the same thing. I just want to get to the to the point where. I want to have, and this is the one. And now you're going to have shear of, of unbending diagram, unbending moments in two different planes. So basically, if you have a, if the, there's a shaft here, kind of inclined shaft, and these are the planes or the axis. Then you can easily see that you have something aim kind of pointing at this direction and something pointing at this direction. And then this is going to end up being something like this. So the resultants of these two types of diagrams or these two diagrams in different planes is going to be different than the individual parts there. So that's why in this specific case, just you need to compute the, the let's say, the vectorial distance between those two points, uh, which is going to be different than, than those. Actually, they are going to be larger than the, the, the largest one, if I'm, if I'm not wrong. And also, if you have different, it would be very nice to see if you have different, let's say, uh, forces applied to these planes, then you're going to have resultants acting differently to different planes. So meaning that it's not as the planar case that everything is going to be beautifully arranged in one graph. But if you try to do this graph in three dimensions, so you're going to have something very, let's say, shaped very regularly when you just take into consideration the shoulders of all of these two diagrams here, or these four diagrams actually. And when we are calculating shafts, or designing shafts in this case, indeed is pretty important to, to have an idea of this. So, so knowing the how to put together the stress tensor for a specific point on a shaft becomes an important skill that you need to have to solve these kind of problems. Because you have forces, you have a torque, that is producing shear stresses. You have uh, bending, uh, other forces that are producing bending moments and are producing also shear. So putting together at least a planner, uh, in this case, a two-dimensional uh, stress uh, element, let's put it in that way, is what is going to allow you to apply then what are the failure theories, uh, like you know for ductile materials or for Reader materials, depending on what you're using in there. And that's as a result, it's going to give you what's the value of that diameter that you're going to have here. So, what we have seen at the, the first kind of as a first material of how to build, construct these uh, 
stress element is very important here. You, you need to have it. Let me delete this. Yeah. About um, the previous slide. Yeah. So when we calculated the maximum stress at the location D, there was a we we used the Pythagoras theorem, but I'm not quite clear why we use the same subscripts. So MDY, I I I know like it's clear where this 1.16 comes from, but where does this 0 0.373 come from? It can be a mistake there, definitely. Yeah, let's try to zoom in this. Where is it? This one, yeah. So you're asking for this one here. Yeah, yeah. All right. OK, so yeah, I got your question. So. Basically, uh, this is not easy seen, but let me look at a larger diagram maybe here. Yeah. So we're taking into account this one here, isn't it? Yeah, because we say, according to this formula, that the largest uh, moment in is becoming or is appearing in point D. Uh, this, is, this is an error. This, this is definitely an error. So in point D, this is 1.16, which is this one here. So I'm assuming that in point D is where the maximum bending moment is going to be applied. Yeah. But you say, oh, you could say, oh, but you no, know, you have 124. Why not that? Because of this. As we're using Pythagoras to calculate this, this or the distance formula to calculate this uh, resultant vector. So I need to compare, okay, this distance in point D and this distance in point D here. Because this would correspond to point D here. This is point D. Point D in the plane XZ and this point D in the plane XY. Yeah. So this is more or less going to be equal to 0 0.373. That's why that appears there. Uh, but let me just figure out something. So if I would take 1.24 here, this is in point C, you say, why did you didn't take point C? Well, because point C here is way small. I don't know how much it is, but way smaller than this. And the resultant between the red lines and the green lines, turns out that the green lines, resultant of the green line is larger than that. That's why uh, this, this comes from the moment in point D. And if we wanted to call it, let's put it in this way. Okay, this is acting in the, this is X, Z, this is X, Y. Yeah, this should be C. Yeah. yeah, points to you, Kenya, that's it, yeah. But is it clear where that 0 0.73 the three seven threes come from? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a good thing. It should be explained here, actually, but it's not. Yeah. Sorry, I just tried to calculate it. I'm not quite getting the same value of 0 0.373. I How much that. are you getting? 376. <laughs> OK, well, that's a good one. But I don't know if that's significant <laughs> or if I'm doing it wrong, because I just did 0 0.94 times the 400. No, that's valid. That's valid, you know. Okay. Uh, but that's a good. That's a good uh, thing. Yeah. Thank you. Now those are good. Those are good comments. Yeah. So yeah, this is something. Yeah, that that that's why I come from this one. But again, there is a fundamental mistake at the beginning of this uh, that I would like you to tell me or to point out which one it is. But. Uh, Yeah, and then basically what it comes is that this uh, finding out the maximum principal stresses, the, the maximum principal stresses, not graphically using more circle, but well, this is a result of more circle application. So the maximum of the shear stress, 
and then you can do something like Tresca or bomb misses to, you know, depending on the type of material you're using to calculate what are the, let's say, if the material is going to, what's the diameter you need to use so the force uh, can be, or the loading can be handled there. Yeah, for example, in this, in this example, it says that, uh, let me see if I get to the result. Uh, let me see in here. C yeah, this is a, a result. Now, important with this is also to consider that if as a designer you should say, hey, uh, you know, it's 25.85 millimeters of diameter, or you should say 30. In the sense, even though you are over, let's say, oversizing the part, and that has to be again with the commercial side of the design process, because if you go to a commercial facility that sounds round bars and they say, well, you know, the closest to this one is thirty, so, and you are, let's say, commercial sizes are thirty or forty millimeters, you know, and you say, well, I can pick thirty, but you know, but if you are, you are, let's say, how to call it. Uh, very stubborn and say no no it has to be 25 millimeters 26 at the most that would imply that if you buy the 30 millimeter diameter bar you would have to put it you have to machine it to take it from 30 millimeters to 26 or 25 millimeters and that costs money then it would cost more money than using the damn you know 30 millimeters bar so uh, round bar so those are the, the economical or commercial considerations you need to have when designing stuff. So it's not only based on, again, I want to, to reemphasize this, it's not only based on the stresses and the safety factors or measures that you're getting, but also what is commercially commercial, commercially sound to, to select in these cases. So that's something very important and could make a huge difference between making a project viable or not. So, so we need to keep an eye on that. So here is discussed also about the utilizing a different type of theory, and then kind of well, in this case I use another calculator. You know, you can find already this in in internet. You know, kind of you know, and I really like them that you just put the values of the, your stress tensor of stress element, and it would construct the Morse circle for you, even though you can do it manually. But uh, this is very awesome to have for nowadays. But this is just to compare that you know you could use any other uh, failure theory to that, and then if you remember that graph that compare across you know different theories, you would you you if you remember correctly, and this is a pretty good question that just by looking at the graph, uh, it was said that Tresca was the one who let's say was more rigorous at the moment of providing an answer to which in this case diameter you should use meaning that results driven by tresca failure theory uh, are going to be larger in size than results driven by bomb misses. as well not that that difference but they're going to be different but smaller in the bomb misses case so and again what, what should i use well you know that's a criteria of that's a, something that you need to, to take into account as a designer but just by looking at the figure tresca I don't want to put it in simplistic terms, but, but it would be something like Tresca is safer to use than bomb misses, and bomb misses is safer to use than, for example, the maximum uh, principal or the, the, the maximum uh, the principal stress, kind of maximum stress that they can have as a theory also for breeding or ductile materials. So, so this is a very good question. And then in this case comes again the terms of of deformation, but I wanted to do it a very bit, bit simple. And what I did here was to use a superposition method to calculate the, the effect of the different forces on the shaft, meaning that super, the superposition theory, uh, method to calculate the flexion, what it states is that you can add up the contributions of individual loads or forces acting on the, on the shaft or on the element, and then that's going to be the final deformation. When you add up everything, that's going to be the final deformation of your part. 
uh, it's pretty simple in the application point of view, but if you wanted to automate, for example, any design process uh, using a software, uh, it's not that simple. So it's not that, that you know, computer friendly in that sense. Simple manually, but not computer simple. Because you, know, you have different equations and you have different cases and you will have to do some tricks. So you're not going to get just one equation to determine the deformation at any point of the, of the beam or, or the shaft, but you have to have many of those. And additionally, I'm using kind of applying, I want to know what are the, what is, what are the angle of rotation produced by that deformation, because again, we are having kind of a gears mounted here. We're having a bearing, and then the deformation of these is going to affect, affect tremendously on the contact between bearings and on the sorry, the contact between the gear teeth, gear tooth actually, well, more than one actually are in contact at all time, according to the design design rules. But you know, depending on how much is the, are these angles, then you know this is going to be suffering. Uh, we we may be imposing an accelerated uh, damage to the to the whole element. So that's why it's calculated here. And what you're going to see is simply you know application of all the forces once over and over again until you find the you know, the maximum deformation. And this is interesting to see that for this case, if I'm I didn't make any mistakes, the deformation is close to a millimeter. And imagine that depending the deformation on shafts is highly depending on the rotational speed of the shaft and on the elements mounted on that. So and sometimes these are the type of deformation limits you can find in such designs. So zero point zero two millimeters. Imagine that. And uh, so, how much is good? How much is bad deformation? Well, it depends on the application. You know, if you have a high compressor, you know, turning at forty-five thousand you know, RPMs, you know, believe me, uh, your your deformations, let's say restrictions, are going to be super high, meaning that deformation is going to be close to zero as a requirement. So, so that's something that to consider later in this sense. Yeah, so everything depends on what you're what you're working with. Questions so far? All right, we will stop at this point and uh, we lost well i lost i made, I made you lot yeah, made you lost a class last week because you know the flu but i would like i would make plans to recover that class and uh try to catch up but i felt that it was important to have this because this topic is very practical but it has many details and i would love maybe in the near future to see more of real case examples uh, when calculating these, these you know, designing shaft or designing beams because they're pretty interesting to to work on. So, so but we'll stop at this point. And if you have any questions, please uh, ask. I will post exercises, evaluated exercises for next week. So this week, take it easy. Uh, we will do it. I will put it on Wednesday. So. No worries about that. No, don't stress about that. Um, regarding the uh, example exercises that you had for the failure theories, if I remember right. Yeah. Uh, when will the solutions for those be uploaded? Yeah, I will post it over the weekend. So I have it in very bad shape, but I will as I put it beautifully or as beautiful as possible. So you can follow along like the two two previous I have uh, presented. So I, I believe it's a great way to do it because it, it builds up a some sort of you know answer uh, document uh, solutions document or something like that. So we put it in that format and upload it so you can have it. Yeah. All right. Thank you. No, thank you for that. And then I also sent you an email a question about the um, durability, uh, sorry, brittleness and ductility. Yeah. 
I was wondering if you've got any further because you said you'd keep looking into it. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. I couldn't. I kind of. I haven't had the time to look for it. Yep. But definitely, uh, what I mentioned. So, Frederick asked about uh, when we talked about failure theories. Uh, we said, well, materials are, are either ductile or brittle, and then you have formulas for one and formulas for other. But if there were cases where there was a material that would range in between, if I got it correctly, Frederick. Is yeah. It, okay. Exactly. Yeah. So I would say that in the when it comes to design in, in real case you are going to find out either materials are ductile or brittle that's it kind of a binary uh, classification in that sense so from the designer's standpoint uh, there are no worries about you know finding out these these strange elements so uh so you go and then you say i'm going to design this type of shaft i know that the material is going to be in, in, in American standards 4045, 4043, and then okay, this is ductile, and then I use this formula, and that's it. Clo deal is closed. However, if you go to several other applications where are out of the normal case, then yes, uh, I would assume that for specific cases, there are going to be specific instructions of what to use. And to accomplish that for sure, in those very special cases where you're going to use uh, materials that are not fitting well between, you know, either completely ductile or completely brittle, uh, there are going to, there's going to be a very precise guideline about how you are going to calculate, you know, the stresses on those materials. So I wouldn't worry on that sense either. You'll find that. However, as a complement in the question, there is a measure of of how ductile a material is. Uh, that ranges from zero to one being zero i believe is completely ductile and one completely brittle and then you know materials can be located in between those the zero one and that uh, ductile to brittle ratio or ductility ratio or something like that is going to condition uh, it's going to condition how do you calculate or which failure failure theory you use to calculate them so that's the part that i need to investigate more kind of to come up with some sort of mathematical sense about what to do in those cases However, I would have it covered that uh, close to 100% of the application we are going to work on or in our lives are going to be either ductile or brittle. If not, we're going to have precise guidelines of what to use to calculate like a standard that would tell, hey, if you want to calculate the, the beam or the shaft for this application, you know, the standard says that you have to use this formula, as I mentioned in the past class. And if not, then, you know, that's the part that I need to, to find out and present. Great. Any other question? Or, or Freddy, do you have a spe specific case for that application that you were asking? No, it just came to mind. Um, okay. Curiosity. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's good. Then, well, is this about the evaluated exercise one um, that I figured out how to solve it the more textbook way? But, but prior to doing that, I solved it using um, MATLAB and I don't know why it works, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. That, the, um, which, which one was it? This was exercise, the evaluated exercise one number, uh, I think it was four, the very last one where we get the plane. Um, Let me check it out. Yeah, evaluated exercise one, exercise four. We get the three principal stresses and we get the plane. Okay, yeah, I have, let me try to open it, so. Because I got the system of equations where, um, like I made the stress tensor into a system of equations with the um, principal stresses and both are then multiplied by the direction cosine of the plane. Yeah. But then I also made, because using the direction cosines, because they're eigenvalues, you can find the characteristic equation of the, um, what's it called, of the matrix or the stress tensor. Yeah, that's correct. And yeah. from that, then you can make three more equations, which get you 
essentially you can fill out the stress tensor. Um, but the thing that was weird about it was that when I put this system of six equations through Wolfram Alpha, like they were so complicated, I couldn't solve them myself. So I tried putting them through Wolfram Alpha and it couldn't return a result and neither could, uh, I think it's Symbol Lab, this other one I tried, but MATLAB figured it out. And I just wonder if you have any insight onto why that might be the case. So straight kind of feedback about why, uh, no, but I have a comment on top of that. So let me, mm -hmm. this is the exercise that you were mentioning. Yep. Yeah. So basically it works in the way I no, but I want to find it. Just, just a second. I want to get the solutions. Oh, this is solution. Yeah. Yeah. No, but I don't see a plane. No, these are the, I think these are the um, practice exercises. I was talking about the evaluated exercises. Ah, okay. Just a second. So it is in now? Yeah, that one, exactly. Yeah, so to show you that, so if you, okay, first of all, these three principal stresses come from a stress tensor, yeah? I believe you mentioned also that, oh, I don't know, I believe it was somebody else that mentioned that they had to work back the way to get the, the stress tensor or something like that. but. Let's imagine that this is here, the stress sensor that, I'm going to copy this. And put it in. You put it in PowerPoint. So let's imagine that this is here and uh, <laughs> I say, say let's imagine that. Let me find the other one because I want to show where the solution comes from. And I believe I pointed out to somebody where to find out the solution. Just a second. Yeah, this one is I'm going to take a screenshot of this one. Let me paste it here. So, yeah, that's true. So let's imagine that, imagine, just imagine that this these principal stresses come from this stress sensor, yeah? And uh, what we have talked about this is that the stress tensor, tensor, stress tensor belongs to a point inside of the material. And if I move from one point to another, stress tensor is going to be different. However, if I am in a point and I rotate the stress tensor, there are certain conditions that are not going to change. And those are, for example, the invariants. Yeah, invariants are going to be the same, no matter the orientation of the stress tensor uh, you have in one point. So if you don't change points, the invariants are going to be the same. These, these uh, principal stresses are going to be one version of these stress tensor that you have here. The only thing is that you found out a rotation where there are no shear stresses. That's it. Now, we know that if we wanted to find out the normal stress, which is the question, normal shear stress on a plane, 
you would have just to multiply the the stress tensor components times you know the the, the square of the of the direction cosines to get the normal and then you want you you can work your way to calculate uh, let's say the, the shear stress according to this so but what happens when you don't have any shear stresses so this just disappears and basically when you multiply that with the square of the direction cosines to get normal stress and then when you multiply that with just you know a kind of you know this one you multiply that with just one time the the principles the direction cosines then you get you know the vector t so far and then basically that's it that's the way you, you find out the, 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 the thing you don't have to do anything else because the fact that you're using principal stresses is well it's just because it's a, it's a specific com, uh, condition or orientation you find you know from that original stress tensor but that's why you don't need to go further to do anything else in that sense uh you don't have to do anything you know specific or special so you just multiply that by the square of those uh direction cosines and to find all the, all the values now on when you start using angle values to determine the characteristic equation of the stress tensor and then you can solve for that so eigenvalues treatment are very special so eigenvalue determinations you know might be straightforward but you know eigenvalues with eigenvalues you have also eigenvectors and the determination of eigenvectors requires specific algorithms to be able to solve them and and kind of my assumption of why in some cases it works and some cases you know doesn't work is because the way you know the the software you're using is treating to solve the eigenvalue problem which is not simple it's very complex in that sense that's the kind of the only comment i can make about why in, in some point it works when it's on some other forms for parts of it doesn't work uh, i know matlab it has a, a very robust let's say uh, algorithm to calculate you know to using the eigenvalue problem but in that sense, that's quite kind of I can comment on that. No, no, not in the specific of why, but you know, I know that, that you know it's not that easy to calculate you know things using eigenvalues and eigenvectors in that sense. But the solution of the problem, you know, is just straightforward using this formula here. And that's it, kind of basically that that's the way it goes. And also kind of or other, let me bring other formulas that may be more convincing. Yeah, this one here. Let me take a screenshot of that. For example, if you wanted to calculate vector uh, T, which is a vector in an inclined phase, then you would use something like this. See that it's basically multiplying the your stress tensor, except for those shear stress terms, you know. So you multiply once, you get the components of the t vector and then you multiply it again and then you get the components of the normal vector and then you know you subtract both and then you get the the shear stress vector on that plane but that's kind of those are my comments on the eigenvalue problem that you were determining eigenvalues are are a scary thing at some point i don't know if that was completely kind of worse yeah no it helped a bit um All right. All right. But the solution to this problem was just that. Yeah, no, and I eventually figured that out, the more textbook way of doing it. Mm, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you. Any other question you may have, guys? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask about the evaluated exercise for this week. Uh, I might have uh, missed it, but can you just tell us if there would be, um, when would it be posted? No, not this week. So what I mentioned in the, in, at the beginning was that as uh, it it's going to be posted on Wednesday next week. So take this week off. So no problem with that. Yeah. Okay, thank so you. So you haven't missed anything. No. But thanks yeah, for yeah. remembering. Yeah, thank you. No problem. 
also actually this is regarding then the most recent evaluated exercise um yeah. we had the in the third question with the crane hook um i think it was yeah let me check um, basically we kind of realized that uh the formulas that we derived in class yeah um, for um the uh Bending, moment, uh, bending stress and bending the compression due, uh, uh, sorry, the stress due to compression from bending and stress due to, or the tensile stress due to bending, um, yeah. that they were for a beam curved the opposite direction. So they didn't work that, uh, and I'm just wondering what the expectation in that exercise was that we, was it that we would derive the formulas for the, beam that is bent in the opposite direction or was it enough to just know that because the beam is being bent in the opposite direction the formula should be different which uh, uh exercise was number three or yeah, yeah from the most recent evaluated exercises the crane hook one yeah let me bring that one Yeah. Should be this one, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. What do you mean by bend it in the different direction? Mm, this might be easier if I share my screen. If that's oh, right. yeah, sure. Go ahead.
so we had the yeah, okay yeah current hook there and basically what i realized is that the one so we derived these formulas in class using this case yeah but what i realized then when i compare it with the crane hook is that this is a beam that's curved in the same way but it's being the moment applied is in the opposite direction okay so then i thought that the formula and i had a look around online and it seemed that the formulas presented here then are invalid for this case and they should actually be switched well the only kind of let's say in the derivation we did in class it came from the general case to the specifics that we're doing right now so so that's why you may say well well you know we started with something different to what is presented right now but the only consideration kind of they are valid to this equipment to this example you are showing there there are those are totally valid the only consideration that you have to do maybe in a very visual way is try to locate assume which is going to be the point that is going to be in tension and what's going to be the point that's going to be in compression right? and depending on that is that what is going to tell you uh, which formula corresponds to what however the formulas are pretty much valid to this uh, let's say to what we applied here so so they are valid they're valid actually i like the way that you just turned around the, the hook to try to to visualize the situation so no, but because, for example, there are some examples that you're going to see that I posted on YouTube, for example, it was that uh, you have some a members such as the one presented in the in the derivation figure, the one at the top that you're showing there. And then you I said in that example, an exercise that there is a moment that's trying to straighten the bar. So calculate, you know, compressive and, and, and tensile stresses there. And for example, for the upper figure, uh, the assumption is that the upper fiber is going to be in tension and the lower fiber is going to be in compression. If I change the size, the side, the, the direction of the moment, then you know those cases are going to be inverted. And that's what's happening right now, or happens in yeah. the print group. So they are valid, Frederick. They are valid. Okay. Yeah, yeah because what however, I'm doing however, is switching the formulas. And it seemed to give a more reasonable result and consistent with what I could find online, but I could just be wrong. Okay, but what is important is that you explain what was mentioned there and stuff. So that's also that's mm -hmm. that's pretty valuable, you know, for the exercise solution mm -hmm. point of view. So not sure. to worry about that. Right. All right. Okay. 